Good afternoon. So um, you have to bear with me. I have my uh, Swedish accent, um, and you know when we taught uh, English in in school in in Sweden. Uh, so now I lost. Okay, uh, and and then I spent some time in the U.S. Now it be American Swedish. Uh, we see what kind of accent I start with and what I will end up with. Anyway, so uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in, in London and, and feel the rain that uh, you know, welcomed me last, last night. So um, I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training, uh, but um, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, working at MIT in Boston right now as a research scientist. So uh, of course I will talk about osseointegration, but I will also talk about some of the add-on features that we're trying to explore uh, uh, in the U.S., but also we do some, still some things in, in, in Gothenburg. And just to make sure that you understand that uh, I'm a very biased uh, person because I'm, I'm both the founder and the chairman of the Integrum company that is uh, developing and producing and selling implants. Um, so uh, bear, bear that in mind. So let's see, so how did this start? How did the entire Austrian integration field start? Uh, it started with basic science, uh, with an interest to study microcirculation in bone tissue. And how do you study microcirculation in bone tissue? Because the bone is not transparent. So a researcher came up with the idea that, okay, I develop an implant, and that implant will have a a small window, so there can be a very thin layer of bone that can grow into that window, and it's so thin so it will be transparent. And that researcher <clears throat> reached out to uh, a person that knows a lot, and that was an orthopedic surgeon, of course. Uh, and that orthopedic surgeon told him, and this is now the late 50s, okay, there is a very interesting new material that's supposed to be good with bone tissue. Why don't you try it out? And that uh, material was titanium. So the first implant to be used for microcirculation studies in bone tissue uh, was made out of titanium. And here you see the uh, young researcher looking into microcirculation in a rabbit tibia for the first time. This uh, implant was um, uh, expensive for a, for a young researcher to manufacture, so he tried to remove it from the rabbit bone and put it into the next rabbit, but he couldn't remove it. And that was just creating a, some sort of distortion in his research setup. Um, and he didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. However, he continued to study bone healing. He worked with plastic surgeons working with cleft palate defects. And a number of those patients had problems with dentition. So the first clinical application with titanium implants for osseous integration were dental implants. Maybe you know that uh, the researcher and the clinician moving this field forward was Perin Ladron, like uh, my, my father. And here you see he died 2014, and you can see the picture that's been used many, many times all over the world showing what osseointegration is. And what is osseointegration? Well, I would say today we still don't fully know what it is. If you go to the textbooks, this is one of the definitions. And it's saying that instead of creating a foreign body reaction around the biomaterial that we thought in the 60s must always happen, there is no foreign body reaction. There is no inflammatory reaction. And there is no fibrous tissue embracing, trying to protect the body from the biomaterial. So can we really say that there is no inflammatory reaction? 
Well, actually, there is an inflammatory reaction in the beginning, but for some reason, titanium is interacting with the inflammatory cells of the body and down-regulating them. So, from a clinical perspective, there is really no foreign body reaction. So you get good healthy tissue in direct contact with the biomaterial. And that is one of the reasons why I can show this picture. And this is a patient treated by my father. She got her dentition. And you see that this is a picture I borrowed in 1999. And then he'd be, she'd been 30 years on the implant. So this can really last for long. And is the reason that titanium is so good? To some extent, but I actually feel it's the other way around. This is because bone is such a fantastic biological material. So it can really stand to have these titanium pins in for so long without kicking them out. So in the early days, this was just intraoral implants, penetrating the mucosa, and it took almost 20 years to convince the clinical society that it could really work, because this was very controversial. In 1977, the first permanently pin pe skin penetrating implants were placed. And this is a, another example of problematic fitting for a prosthetist, because how can you attach something if you miss an eye. You can use it on the glasses, and then it will be heavy prosthesis. And if you go out in society and you do it like this, you will drop your face. Because, you know, the glasses will fall off and the eye with them. And that is not really a confident situation. If you lost an ear, you can make, if you're a good prosthetist, you can do a, a Hollywood smashing like ear. You can't really see the difference. If you, for some reason, have a tumor of the nose and you need to remove the nose, go out in society without the nose. And of course, if you, <coughs> if you don't really like to see doctors and you have something growing in your face, and then suddenly you need to realize, OK, I need to go and see a doctor, and you end up in a situation like this. So this is a devastating thing for many reasons, you know, functional, aesthetic, and also from a social interactive perspective. And these are very rare, and this is a patient treated by my father, and I built a custom design setup together with very skilled dental te technicians or anaplastologists, that, that's it called, and we're finally to create something that is looking much more sort of attractive. And the key here for this specific patient was that she was a mother of three, and the kids couldn't stand her face. So she couldn't interact with her own kids. But with this situation, she could do it again. And these are the things we should pay attention to. It might be very individualized needs. and might be special attention that the patients require. But I think the patients are worth it. What if you bring engineers to the table? So that happened in 1978, and mm -hmm. then an engineer said, OK, why can't you hear with an implant? So this is the bone anchored hearing aid. So by putting a small implant that is rigidly connected to the skeleton, you can pick up uh, sound and transfer it through the rigid connection through the skeleton to the inner ear, like this. And bypass if you don't have an external ear or if you have other problems. And this is now a procedure that can be used in more than 100,000 patients worldwide. So, so most of the things in the beginning up to actually to 1990 was mostly oral implants and then some uh, bone anchored hearing aid, aids, etc. So let me turn to, to what is the field I've been working in, uh, and that's orthopedic osteointegration. And um, why, why should we consider that? The uh, socket prosthesis that uh, uh, has historically been used, isn't that a good system? 
uh, looks fairly robust here. This is an uh, Australian farmer. Um, but if you start to look into the details, you see, okay, this is the mechanism for, for load transfer. So, so how are we built? We, what is the load-bearing structure in the human? It's the skeleton. And the soft tissues are not really designed, except, you know, for the soles and, and the hands and so on, to have a lot of pressure on them all the time. So that means over time you will start to see skin deterioration, pain and ulcers. And it's also so that the load transfer mechanism is not a rigid connection, it's like a sloppy connection. And that's not really perfect. And that is something we've known for long. So in the 60s, they tried to fix this with bone anchored, uh, with bone anchored uh, implants, um, but it failed. It didn't integrate, uh, they got infection, they did a lot of uh, animal research, Department of Defense sponsored, but it failed, so they stopped that program. So if you um, go to PubMed, where you have most of the scientific literature, and you do a search on osteointegration or osteointegrated, uh, like I did this morning, you get uh, uh, a bit more than 14,000 scientific papers on osteointegration. <coughs> so is osteointegration the solution to everything? No, but uh, it is definitely one solution for osteointegrated amputation prosthesis. And this is the first patient in the world treated bilaterally uh, in 1990, in May 1990, Today it's uh, June 2019. She had uh, her implants successfully for 23 years and then I replaced them in 2014 and we hope that the new ones will last for another 23 years at least. What is this uh, all about? So instead of transferring the load through the soft tissues and through the skin, there is nothing really touching the skin. It goes directly into the skeleton where the load is supposed to be transferred. Uh, the opera system consists of two major components. One intramedullary fixture and then a skin penetrating piece called abutment. So it's a modular system and there are different reasons for that. We have over the years, took us about 10 years to set up a, a standardized treatment protocol uh, and that is called the OPRA treatment protocol. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, even though osteointegration integration was coined by my father in 1977 in the US, we are not allowed to use the word osteointegration. So that's why in the US this is called the osteo-anchored system. And for some reason we can use that word. So, the system is the, uh, it based on a, the very conservative approach that, that, that in the way that dental implants started. So it's a two-stage procedure, which is, if you go and read the literature, it's a safer way of addressing it. And, you know, from Sweden and from Gothenburg, and what do we have there? The safest car in the world, Volvo. So, you know, Swedes go for safety, and maybe we're a bit slow, but we're working on that, we speed up a bit. Um, we have what we call stage one and we have stage two and uh, here you see it's a healing period of six months. That's something we we'll talk about because that's something we're starting to change. The, the surgical procedure, uh, it, uh, this is fairly straightforward uh, orthopedics. Um, we have done that together here in London, it went uh, very well. Um, and what we do is that uh, we make sure that we uh, drill the right size of, the, of, a, of a hole intramedullary based on preoperative CT scans. And then we use fluoroscopy during surgery to guide us. And then we use a thread tap that is like a test implant and it's perfectly cutting threads inside the bone. So 
and we are also countersinking. You see, it goes beyond the end level of the bone. There is a certain reason for that when it comes to, we talk about skin replacements. We have a meticulous system of handling the implant, so it's never touched by anything than directly biological tissue to avoid contamination. And then we let it there to heal. Just like you can say a fracture healing. So the old protocol said six months. The new protocol says three months. And that is currently being evaluated by the Department of Defense in the, in the US as well as other centers. Uh, after the first surgery, you can go back and use a socket. You need to tell both the patient and the prosthetist to avoid end bearing. Uh, because there the end of the bone can be damaged if you do that. And we add calcium and vitamins because that is optimizing bone healing. The second stage procedure that is very special for the Oprah implant system. And I know that some of the details will be more extensively covered, so I will give you just the principles because they contradict normal amputation surgery. So here you see the leg is open up, and what we actually do, instead of trying to cover the bone end with muscles, we cut away the muscles, we suture them in a meticulous way, and you see there, here there's like a hole. And that's a special way of preparing the skin interface for it to last for long. And all these small X's, they, they are all the small sutures that I or the plastic surgeon in collaboration we put together. And we spend hours on preparing the skin interface. This is what it looks like. Here you see that you have uh, uh, the thing in the middle, that is the bone that is sort of protruding out of what we call the muscle platform. And here you have uh, where the skin or the fat is removed. And then that part should be put directly on bare bone. And this is the, the first time you show that. So I know that part of we talk about the skin interfaces and Jason Sousa, the, the plastic surgeon at the military hospital, uh, in the US, he was super scared when he saw this because, oh, this will never work. But if you do this correctly and fold it up, after a couple of weeks or after a couple of years, it will look like this. So what is the key here? The key is immobilize the skin. If you check around your teeth, or nays, you know, it's immobilized. That's how nature is doing it. The problem is how can you immobilize skin to an implant? So I would say you can't. There have been numerous attempts in the history and they always fail. But we can attach skin to bone. And that is what we're doing here. So this is the surgery part. And even though it's great to be an orthopedic surgeon, surgery will not solve everything, and we learned that the hard way. We thought that this was most of a surgical procedure, but we learned that if we can get the right team together and have a control rehabilitation prosthetic fitting with physios, prosthetist, and compliant patient, we get much better results. And this will be addressed uh, later this afternoon also by uh, John Sullivan and Andrew Rees. So I will just say, okay, Shastin Hogberry, our lead physio, she's been fantastic to help to develop a rehab program. And conceptually, what is it that we need to think about? Well, if you've been an amputee for long, not really being able to ambulate in a normal way, of course you need to retrain the muscles. But you also need to retrain the skeleton. 
Because if you don't load and use the skeleton, the skeleton will sort of start to disappear. That's osteopenia, you know, osteoporosis, etc. And maybe, you know, there is one reason why man cannot go to Mars and come back. Because being out of the Earth gravitation field for so long and not have loading on the skeleton will be, mean that the skeleton will be so impaired so when you come back to Earth, your body will collapse. So that, that, that's an indication how important loading is. And it's actually so that if we go into the details that's in this picture and go further down to the real details, is the fluid shear stress that is stimulating osteoblast, the bone building cells. And if we can control that, we can tell the bone cells to build more bone. And how do you do that? That is something everyone knows. What is the best way of maintaining the skeleton? Loading. So by controlling loading, we can control that the bone will remodel and get stronger and stronger over time. If we overload, it will be a failure. If we underload, it will take too long. So how can we really balance this? But there is, you know, we all look different. So that means we need to have individualized protocols and to be able to individualize, you need to have a good and strong team working together. And you need experience. So is it so that um, this is a treatment without complications? No. Infection is a big part of the problem. Uh, we see skin infections and we can see deep infections. We can talk about that later, how that can be addressed, but that is still a major concern for uh, osseointegrated devices. There can be mechanical complications. Um, if you have falls, you can fracture your skeleton, but you can fracture the implant if you have an implant. In overall, what we have seen in, in a prospective study in 50 above knee amputees is that you have uh, about 90% success rate. So that 9 out of 10 it will be good, but still for 1 out of 10 it will really not work well. But for those that it's working, it's a great thing. You can see here, you can use the prosthesis more, you have better mobility, you have less problems, you have improved general physical health related quality of life. So that means that quality of life is improving, which is uh, utterly you know, the, the thing we are looking for. And we just published the five year data and it's roughly the same. So we don't have more late failures up to five years. So up to five years, we have roughly 90% success rate. And, and these studies paved the way for uh, FDA approval. So presently the Oprah implant system is the only uh, FDA approved uh, implant. And uh, we have a number of uh, uh, places in the world using it. And there are a number of uh, followers. So here is a, I don't think this is a full list, but this is a list of different competing or emerging technologies. So I mostly talked about legs, but of course this is a technology that can also be used for, if you lose a thumb, you put in an implant, you build a nice prosthesis and then you can do uh, a lot of things. You can use it on a below elbow amputee, especially if you have a short stump, it's difficult with a socket. You can use a, a body power device, you can use a myoelectric device. If you have a short uh, uh, above elbow um, amputation, you can use this. This is with training prosthesis. This is uh, with myoelectric control. This is extremely useful if you have a very short stump where it's almost impossible to use an arm prosthesis whatsoever. This is an ongoing study in the US with the Department of Defense, and uh, um, they use this as a number of above elbow amputees. Uh, this is very, very early data, just a few patients, but you can see here the enormous increase in uh, use of the prosthesis. 
And here is an example of uh, uh, the benefits from a user perspective if, if you lost both arms. Uh, how difficult it is to manage the socket prosthesis and put it on. And by using an OSI integrated device, uh, life will be much simpler. So even there are a lot of things you can do by attaching prostheses. Um, there's still a lot, lot left. So uh, I will briefly cover some of the things that we have done and we are doing uh, in the future. Um, and we were very pleased that we got the Brian Joyce Blatchford Award for our work on trying to move this field forward in 2017. This was mostly a collaboration uh, from the different centers in, in Gothenburg. And our aim was to, oh, sorry. To do what we call a brain-controlled prosthesis, but it's not really a brain-controlled prosthesis in that sense that we put something into the brain because we think that's dangerous. So the plan was not only attach uh, the prosthesis in the best possible way, it was to try to interact with the brain so that the brain would think that the arm was there again. And the plan was to not take the brain signals until they reach the peripheral, and then from the muscles and nerves, pick up the signals, drive the prosthesis, and then use sensors in the prosthesis and give artificial sensory feedback back to to the brain, just like a normal hand is working. And that is what we call the EOPRA system. And here you can see that the, uh, what I call the stupid implant is upgraded with electrodes that go to <coughs> muscles and to nerves. So this is uh, Magnus Niska, he's the first patient in the world with this system. He was treated in 2013, January 29th. And here is showing what he's doing with ordinary surface electrodes. And when he's moving his arm, he has difficulties to control his grip. But he also has implanted electrodes that are picking up the signals with high precision directly on the muscle. And there he has full range of motion and perfect control. And not only that, this is built as a take-home device. And he is a van driver in the northern part of Sweden, where it's cold and it's very difficult with the uh, uh, electrodes because skin impedance will change if it's cold or warm. And he can be, he can even visit me in, in California if you like. And maybe you saw that we had some nerve cuff electrodes. So in the lab we were able to show that his brain could perceive touch on parts that did not exist anymore. So we used that to build um, a take-home device and he's now trying it for the first time where you have an artificial sensory feedback. So in the fingers of the prosthetic hand, there are pressure sensors. And those pressure sensors go to a neurostimulator that is built and contained in the ordinary prosthetic arm. And that neurostimulator is tingling the nerve. And the nerve is sending signals to the brain and say, oh, something is touching my fingers. So based on all the training that needed to be able to drive this in a good way, we created a virtual world that is now becoming another thing. And I will just mention, so this virtual reality, we actually now use to train amputees to get rid of their phantom pain. And that's something called the uh, uh, neuromotors, and it was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago. 
So if I can take a few more minutes just to share what's happening in the US. So this is the uh, US team. You have uh, Hugh Herr, a bilateral transcivil amputee. He's the head of the biomechatronics lab at uh, MIT, where I'm presently working. Uh, Jonathan Forsberg is the head of the Department of Defense Osseo Integration Program. Dean Kamen, the Segway guy, that uh, come up with the loop arm that is the most advanced arm prosthesis in the world. Todd Kaiken, the man behind TMR. Uh, Paul Sederna, the man behind RPNI. And then you have the E. Oprah and the Swedish team. So, so the, 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 the thinking here is how can we uh, move further with muscle and nerve interfaces to make the prosthesis come alive? So one thing is targeted muscle re-innovation, and I know Norbert here is uh, one of the most experienced uh, surgeons, at least in Europe. And conceptually, what is is tricking the brain. So if you lost your arm, you still have the nerves. You rewrote the nerves that should go to the arm into other muscles. And in the first case, this was done to the pectoralis muscle. And here is that patient. So this is Todd Kaiken's hand, and he's telling the patient to think to do what I'm doing with my hand, and then you see his, his chest is playing much better than Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and you see, this is, so what's the pattern here like? That's very difficult to interpret. But with pattern recognition algorithms, what is today more known as artificial intelligence, you can help to drive a prosthesis in the right way. Another way of approaching a control strategies is to build agonist-antagonist muscle interfaces. And that's what I've been doing at MIT and Brickhouse in Boston. So when they do an amputation, they maintain the balance between agonist and antagonist, just like we control our joints intuitively. And what they can show is that So here is Mr. Ewing, the first patient to receive the procedure. It's now called the Ewing procedure. And he's driving an ankle joint. And you can see that for an ordinary amputee, it will just be flat all the time. But just by walking without thinking, he will lift up the toes a little bit and put it down. So this is showing that the brain can be tricked to think that the ankle joint is still there. So how can we bring this to a larger patient population? And the world leading expert with power lower leg prosthetics, that's you, her. So the idea is, can we build this inside an above knee amputee? So how can we do that? TMR is not really work, and we can't really harvest the way they've done for the Ewing procedure. Then the solution is RPNI, Paul Sederna, Ann Arbor. And what is this? This is a regenerative peripheral nerve interface. You take, like for the TMR, you take a cut and damaged nerve, you wrap it around a small muscle graft and create what we call a burrito. And how can you use this? Okay. So this will act as an amplifier of the nerve signal. And that makes it easier to detect it because nerve signals are very difficult to decipher with electronics. So here you can do it. And you can also see that we can split the nerve and have several small bioamplifiers for a nerve, more creating maybe one for each finger. It's still a bit in the future. The problem with this technology is that these are fairly small muscles and the myoelectric signal will not reach through the skin. So to really be useful, you have to have implanted electrodes. And now you start to see how it's fitting together. So by attaching two RPNIs to each other, it's been shown today just in animals that that can be used to create a feeling for the brain that the joint is moving. So now we're starting to create artificial joint construct that the brain will perceive as the joint is moving. And we now have funding to start to do this in humans. So if there are existing muscles, we can put electrodes directly. If we need to create these 
artificial fake joint systems with the RPNIs, we can do that. And we can instrument everything and we can drive it out through the body. So I think we come a long way. And uh, you remember that video, John? Uh, this is from one of the very rare occasions when it was sunny at the uh, Roehampton <laughs> Douglas Body Unit. This is a video I got from Kingsley Robinson. Uh, it's from 2005. So it's been quite a walk. We're adding some features with uh, uh, newer prosthetics. We learn more how the brain can interact. We add newer system with uh, implanted electrodes. And we add the next generation of uh, uh, smart biological reconstructions that would trick the brain to think that the extremity is still there. So you can start to feel that you haven't really lost the leg or your arm. It feels like your own. And, and this is just about to happen clinically for the first patients now. So I feel there is, there is hope. Will we ever, ever be able to, to play the piano? Well, you know, I can't play the piano, so I don't care. But I feel that this could be a, a great conference. So just one final slide. Why Oprah? So I think there are, I try to cover uh, some of the things. So, so bear this in mind during the afternoon when we talk about that. You know, we have almost 30 years of experience. Of course, we've done a lot of mistakes and hopefully we improve things. Well, and I think we have, we have a recognized reputation. We have an FDA approved device. We work very thoroughly with certification programs. We learn the lesson. You need to have a team approach. Well, we can, we can use uh, our system for almost all amputations level. We have safety devices that I think we will talk about a little bit later because, you know, if you don't have a, a leg, there is a great risk of falling and then like going downhill skiing. I'm not a great downhill ski. Well, a reasonable good downhill ski, but I still have a ski bindings on. I, I don't go there without it. Uh, I think we have a, a, a good way of addressing the skin interface. Uh, there are also some things related to design when it comes to revision. You need to think about something that should last for a lifetime of the patient. It will not really last a lifetime. There must be revision options. And I also, so I like research. I think, you know, the, the way we can interact with the body with TMR, RPNIs, implanted electrodes, uh, and, and all the implants we're using right now, they can be upgraded. So all the patients that... Uh, we use with the EOPRA system, that have been OPRA implant system uses, and they can be upgraded with a fairly simple procedure. So that's also thinking about what lies in the future. Thank you very much.